Assalamualaikum and hi everyone, I'm Arfa, so today we will be talking about um, IKEA, uh, mainly the extreme files. But before I get into that, I'd like to share a little bit more about uh, on IKEA. So, um, what is IKEA? IKEA is a single-celled, a primitive single-celled uh, prokaryotic microorganism that has no nucleus or any other membrane-bound organelles, and they can survive in very severe conditions. So generally, that is what IKEA is. Alright, so now that we know what IKEA is, let's talk about who first discovered it, how and when. So back in the late 1970s, an American biologist, Dr. Carl Woos, along with his colleagues at the University of Illinois, they did a research on the relationship between prokaryotes using DNA sequences, and they found two very distinct groups. The bacteria that lived in high temperatures, or the ones that could produce methane, were discovered to be um, clustered together as a group, well away from the usual bacteria and eukaryotes. So, because of these huge differences, he came up with the hypothesis that prokaryotes were split into two lineages early in the history of life. And he proposed that life to be uh, divided into three domains, eukarya, eubacteria, and archaebacteria. But after a while, he decided that the name archaebacteria was a misnomer, so he shortened it to archaea. Um, and even though a lot of textbooks and articles still use the term uh, archaebacteria to address them, this term is long abandoned because uh, it is inaccurate. They are not bacteria, but well, they are archaea. Alright, just a little bit more on archaea. The word archaea is derived from a Greek word, archaeos, uh, that means ancient or primitive. And archaea can uh, produce methane and live in uh, very hot places like the hot spring. They have very distinct uh, molecular uh, characteristics that uh, is very different from bacteria and eukaryotes and even their cell wall don't have peptidoglycans that can be found in the cell walls of bacteria. Uh, their cell wall and membrane are also stiff so that uh, it can give them shape like uh, rod shape or cubic shape and sometimes they exchange or take up um, plasmids containing DNA from the environment or like they exchange it with uh, other cells. This uh, enables them to survive in uh, the extreme conditions. Alright, so as I said earlier, uh, in this video, I will be focusing more on the extremophiles, so we'll get into that. An extremophile is an organism that thrives under uh, extreme conditions that were once uh, thought not able to sustain life. And these conditions include extreme heat, highly uh, acidic environment, um, extreme pressure, high salt concentration um, areas, and so many more. Okay, so who are extremophiles? Extremophiles are primarily uh, prokaryotic uh, organisms, so they are either archaea or bacteria, but I mean there are some eukaryotic extremophiles, just not very common. And the reason these organisms can survive in uh, extreme conditions uh, is because they have um, special enzymes called extremozymes that helps them survive. And Alright, so moving on, there are a few types of extremophiles, um, but in this video I'll be talking about three, uh, methanogens, thermophiles, and halophiles. So these extremophiles are named or defined uh, by the environmental conditions uh, in which they grow or thrive in. So for example, thermophile means it is heat loving and it thrives in really really hot um, areas or places. So the first uh, extremophile that I'll be talking about today is methanogen. Methanogen is an anaerobic uh, prokaryote from the domain archaea uh, that produces methane gas uh, or methane as a metabolic byproduct in hypoxic conditions. Alright, so now we're going to talk about the habitats of methanogens. You can usually find methanogens in uh, swamps, wetlands, marshes, bogs, and they are responsible for the marsh gas. Uh, marsh gas, swamp gas, bog gas are all a mixture of methane with hydrogen sulfide and carbon dioxide produced in that area. Um, you can also find methanogens in digestive tracts of animals like in cows, termites, and even us humans. And they are responsible for uh, the belching in some ruminants, or in other words, the burping in some ruminants, and also flatulence in humans, or in other words, farting. About the shape of um, the methanogens, the two most common ones are cocoid and basilic, uh, which means spherical shaped uh, or rod shaped. And there are also some limitations to uh, methanogens. Since they are anaerobic um, organisms, they cannot function or hold up very well in aerobic conditions. And they are very sensitive to the presence of oxygen, even in the slightest bit. Um, they also cannot sustain uh, oxygen stress uh, for a prolonged time. And also, about the diversity of um, methanogens, there are over 50 different species recorded with 30 signature proteins um, that they have in common. Even though there are so many um, species in methanogens, they all have a few common key features. And for example, the first one, uh, the cell wall of methanogen lack uh, peptidoglycan, just like any other archaea. And sometimes in trees, they have pseudopeptidoglycan instead. And these uh, pseudopeptidoglycans are resistant toward the enzyme lysozyme. They also have a rigid cell wall that helps maintain its shape. 
Alright, so the second key feature um, of methanogen is that every methanogen, they rely on syntrophy. Syntrophy is a close association of an archaea to a bacterial partner in order to, for them to um, obtain key substrates. And the third and final feature is that all methanogens are filamentous. Uh, this means that they have filaments to help them trap the bacterial partners. Now, I'll be sharing about the roles of methanogen. In human, um, methanogen help remove the excess hydrogen in the human gut as well as to they, as well as they help um, increase the digestion efficiency. And in ruminants, uh, they assist the cellulose breakdown in the ruminants. For termites, methanogen act as important symbionts that promote anaerobic cellulose decomposition in the termite hindgut. Um, they are, uh, methanogens are also key agents in the remineralization of continental margin uh, sediments as well as any other uh, aquatic sediments. Last but not least, um, methanogens are used in water treatment. They are the anaerobic digesters that uh, help treat the water or the wastewater as well as the aqueous organic pollutants and they are cost effective and sustainable. So the second extremophile is the thermophile. A thermophile is an organism that can survive at very high temperatures. Mm, where you ask? Well first of all, uh, all thermophiles require a hot water environment. So this is why they are so common in hot springs like the one in Yellowstone National Park, uh, in hydrothermal vents, in deep sea hydrothermal vents, or even in decaying matters like peat box and compost. And they usually need around 60 degrees Celsius up until 80 degrees Celsius for optimal growth. But there are some thermophiles that thrive in conditions with more than one extreme. For example, places with high level of sulfur, high level of calcium carbonate, or places with acid water, or even alkaline springs. So, and they usually, in these conditions, they usually need uh, around pH 2 until 4 for optimal growth. Alright, so let's move on to the adaptation and application of uh, thermophiles. So thermophiles have um, extreme enzymes where the amino acids have special tricks to retain their uh, twisted 3D structure, uh, even in high heat where uh, other organisms would have just unfolded and denatured. And not only that, the proteins produced by thermophiles tend to be more uh, thermostable uh, uh, compared to their mesophilic um, Part. All right, so for the application, thermophile plays a vital role in bio uh, biotechnology processes uh, as it is used for one, um, a source of the enzyme DNA polymerase for the polymerase chain reaction in DNA fingerprinting. It is used to reduce the risk of uh, microbial contamination, it is used to increase the mass of transfer, and it is used to lower the viscosity and increase the susceptibility of some proteins to enzyme molecules. Alright, so let's have a look at all the locations around the world where the thermophiles can be found. So the first location is the Yellowstone National Park in the United States of America. This is the um, national park where the um, most popular thermophile was discovered, the Thermus aquaticus. And the second location is in southwest Iceland, the Great Geyser, where um, the thermophiles can be found colonizing a variety uh, of geothermal uh, features. And the last location is in Russia, the Benzimiani, which means volcanoes, so active volcanoes. So those are the places where thermophiles can be found. The third and final extremophile is the halophile. Halophiles are organisms that thrive uh, in high salt concentration, and the name halophile comes from the Greek word or the Greek name for salt loving. So halophiles, they require um, sodium chloride, which is salt, for growth, while um, halo-tolerant organisms do not require salt, but they can grow um, under saline conditions. And halophiles can be found anywhere uh, with a concentration of salt five times greater than the salt concentration of the ocean. So for example, uh, the Great uh, Salt Lake in Utah, Owens Lake in California, uh, the Dead Sea, and even evaporation ponds. If you can see right here, um, the pink and orange ponds, these are salt evaporation ponds in San Francisco. Have you ever wondered how halophiles survive that extreme condition? Well, most halophilic and halotolerant organisms expend their energy to keep salt out of their cells. This is to prevent um, salt aggregation or in other words, salting out. So what they, what they do is they utilize um, osmoprotectants, which in this case is the potassium chloride. This uh, compatible solute can either be synthesized or taken by, uh, from the environment. Um, they also have um, a pigment called bacterial rhodopsin that act as a light-driven proton, a proton pump, which helps uh, pump out the hydrogen ion out of the cell. Um, okay, so for humans, we put on sunscreen to protect ourselves from the UV rays, right? But for halophiles, 
have a pigment called Bacterial Rubrin, uh, which is also the same pigment that gives them the pink color. Um, this pigment will act as an antioxidant that will protect them and their DNA from the UV light. As a conclusion, it is clear to me that there are so much more to be discovered and I believe that with better understanding of um, the full potential of extremophiles, we can come up with better technologies that can help us obtain a more sustainable life and hence protecting our beloved planet. That is all for me. Thank you so much for listening. Bye. I hope you enjoyed it.